Welcome to Inc.'s The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, the founder of LearnVest, author of New York Times bestselling book, Financially Fearless, and second book, Financially Forward. I'm also the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm focused on the entrepreneurs of the future. Each week, we sit down with a top founder to share their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Alex Von Tobel. And this week, I'm excited for you to meet Dave Rogan Moser, the co founder and CEO of Jasper, an AI content platform. Dave co founded Jasper in 2021 when he recognized the opportunity that GPT 3 presented. Jasper was one of the first companies to get on the OpenAI beta. Davis scaled Jasper to over 100,000 users and a valuation of $1.5 billion in under two years. Davis' passionate about building a future in which AI partners with humans to create content together. Prior to Jasper, he co-founded Proof, a SaaS product that helps build social proof and increase conversion rates by displaying recent customer activity on your website. He's a Y Combinator alum and has a strong passion for marketing. He also is the father to three little boys. And with that, let's welcome Dave. Hi, Dave. Let's just start from the beginning. Um, what is Jasper in your own words? And talk us a little bit through about the aha moment that got you to dive into building one of the breakouts of AI. Yeah, Jasper is a platform that helps marketers and marketing teams write really great content that's better than they were writing before and much faster than they were writing before. So things like blog posts, social media campaigns, um, anything that you know, pretty much marketing teams are, are writing and, and producing, Jasper's there to help them do that. And we launched about two and a half years ago. Um, and it was about two and a half years ago that I'd first seen like GPT-3 and seen just that like AI was starting to get really good. And I was a, a copywriter by background and a marketer. And so I felt like pretty good and felt like I had a pretty high bar for what good content looked like. And it just seemed like it was right there, similar to what I was writing. And, you know, with my guidance, I could get it to be pretty good. And I thought, you know, if I... I think this is pretty good, and I feel like I had a high bar. Um, I think most people will think this is really good. And if we could just package it up in a nice-to-use way and, and kind of simplify the concepts for the masses, you know, we could go and uh, build a tool that people would like. You know, you were really one of the first companies to have beta access to OpenAI. What did you see in that iteration of the technology that excited you? And also, what have you learned as you have been watching the evolution of the technology over the past, let's call it year. Yeah, there was about six months there where I tried to get access and couldn't get access. And so I don't know kind of what number in line I was, but finally got access like in, you know, December of 2020. The first thing that surprised me was I joined this Slack group that had like a bunch of people that had access. And I felt like we were sitting on a gold mine that this is really useful for businesses and really going to change a lot. And most people I was with in that group just talked about it like a toy. And they would just be trying to rewrite the Declaration of Independence in Elvish or just like very like silly, interesting, I mean, unique, clever little things. But I, I was like, it wasn't, I guess, obvious at the time that there was a bunch of great businesses built here. It was almost just this cool technology. And I think, you know, what we did was we just got it into our customers' hands really quickly. You know, it was probably a month in, we released a little super sketchy beta version. I had to demo it on Zoom calls just to even like show them, you know, how to log in and stuff like that. And people were enamored out of the gate. But this is the first time I was like, oh, this is what product market fit sounds like, at least on like those early calls. And this feels like it has some of the markings of a great product. And, you know, it wasn't yet. But that was what surprised me, I think, early on too. And, and again, I think every entrepreneur is just like, if you don't have product market fit, you're you're searching for it. It feels so vague. It feels so nebulous. Like, do I have it? Do I don't? And you know, there's always the the phrase, you know, product market fits one of those things that you'll know it when you have it. And if you don't know it, you don't have it. And that used to frustrate me so much because I was like, you know, I can't work with that. Maybe I don't, but it's like it's obvious in hindsight. Like if if you're frustrated by that, you probably don't have it. But then like once we kind of like got customers and started like growing, it was like, oh, this is what this feels like. Can you walk us through the customer journey? What was it a bit ago? What is it today? Where's it going to go? Um, and who would you say is using Jasper really successfully? Yeah, when we first launched, the product was called conversion.ai. And it was basically like direct response marketing, performance marketing focused, Facebook ads, Google ads, like landing pages, and very like short snippets of content. You know, as we rolled it out, you know, we kept asking users like, what do you want? And they kept saying blog posts long emails, 
longer content. Like that's what we're looking for help on. And so we, you know, got pulled into this content marketing platform. And we were still taking a lot of bets uh, around the edges. You know, we'd release a real estate template that was like real estate listings because we had some realtors doing that. We'd release, you know, all sorts of like little templates just to kind of test different markets. And we weren't going to kind of become a real estate platform, but we wanted to see like, is there something that could pull us into that direction? And really what it came down to was it was always, you know, freelancers, prosumers, you know, small businesses that were just trying to get more done, right in a variety of marketing, you know, assets and collateral. And so we've just developed more and more uh, that direction, obviously with like chat GPT coming out, the bottom of the market got very, you know, much more commoditized. And this is a pretty good, obviously ChatGPT is a very good product that is, you know, general, can do a lot of stuff, you know, well broadly, but it's missing some of those bells and whistles that, you know, a marketer might want and that a bigger business might want. And it also kind of uh, opened up the door to bigger companies actually wanting to buy these kinds of products where, you know, two years ago, like no big company would have wanted to buy this. You would have gotten fired for using a product like Jasper, you know, a year ago, and now you're going to get fired if you don't use a product like Jasper because you're just not going to be productive enough there. And so uh, I think where we've been pulled now is all these larger companies are coming to the table and saying, hey, we want this. We want it to be for teams. We want it to be on brand. We want it to be in our tone of voice. Uh, we want it to know about our company. We want it to be everywhere that we work. And so that's more of the platform that we're moving towards and building because there's this just blue ocean up market. Can you just talk a little bit about your playbook? Pretend all the entrepreneurs listening right now, you're trying to teach them, here's how to have an A-plus good market strategy. What does that look like? Coach us. You know, we wanted and believed that like word of mouth is the strongest, you know, long-term driver of growth. And so we always kind of knew, hey, like that's got to be a big part of this, but you got to get that flywheel started, you know, somehow. And you got to kickstart it. And so, you know, we had the benefit of having, you know, a past company with a list of marketers. And so, you know, we emailed our list, but then we just like started running paid ads pretty aggressively early on. Uh, and again, I don't think paid ads is the answer long term, but man, it was such an effective channel because we had this unique product that had this wow factor that, you know, people would just see while they're scrolling, click it, go sign up, pretty high conversion rates. Like the numbers were all just amazing. Man, we ended up hiring this guy uh, to help scale our ads. The guy we'd worked with before, and he came in and I said, you know, I said, I'm going to pay you 2% of all ad spend as long as our LTV to CAC is better than three to one. And as long as we have a six month payback period, or under six months payback period. So I was like, as long as those things are true, spend as much money as you possibly can, I'll pay you 2% of that. And I don't know if that's a great strategy, you know, for all companies, but it got us on the same side of the table. We went from spending 50,000 a month on ads to a million a month on ads in like 30 days. Very profitably, metrics looked great. And, and that was obviously just like a huge boon. And we ended up having to like walk that back and restructure <laughs> the uh, comp a little bit because it, it, got, it got pretty excessive uh, after a while. But so anyway, I, I'm a big fan of like something like paid ads at the beginning. And I think you gotta, you gotta uh, work on virality. You know, again, this is the kind of product that goes very viral and that everybody tells their buddies about and you know it's very very cool so i think but i think you have to engineer that you have to help people share that you have to create some you know different things in the product that make it something that people want to, to talk about um and we worked on that too but a big part of it was, was paid ads at the beginning can you tell us some of the coolest use cases you've seen for jasper like maybe some of the surprising ones that people just don't think about I've got a book around here. I don't know where it went. There's a, a really cool, you know, children's book that some mom and uh, her eight-year-old son sat down one night and says, like, I want to write a book. And she's like, well, I have a Jasper account. We can go figure this thing out. So she wrote this kid's book, you know, with the son and then using Jasper art created, you know, all the art for this children's book. And like Jasper is not a children's book tool, but you can use it for those things. And, you know, she ended up putting that up on Amazon like the next day. It was like a 24-hour turnaround or eight-year-old selling copies. We ended up kind of sharing it in our Facebook group and, you know, sold a bunch of copies. And, and that was really cool just to see like, okay, like there's this eight-year-old that's like now able to like take something to completion and have a book on Amazon in a month. Like that sounds absolutely insane, but like that's really cool. Most people are using it for marketing use cases, blog posts, social media, Twitter, stuff like that. But there's a really interesting long tail of things like TED Talks or best man speeches or birthday cards that we see people using Jasper for, which is pretty fun. How do you 
think about the different foundation models available for entrepreneurs to leverage right now? You originally started on OpenAI. Can you coach people on like, what have you learned? How do you think about the different foundation models? What do you think that's going to look like two years from now? And how would you advise people to think about building on them? Yeah, early days, I mean, it was just, it was OpenAI and then there was kind of a variety of uh, little open source models or kind of quickly after came some open source models. And, you know, people thought, we were crazy for building entirely on open AI and I had some competitors or kind of tangential companies, you know, they were building, you know, with large language models say, you know, that's crazy. You know, you're, you're running the risk of kind of single point of failure. And I think that's true, but like the risk is so small and speed is so important that it was a trade-off that we were very, very comfortable with. And so we basically didn't think about building any of our own stuff or using other models or anything like that for the first, I don't know, year and a half while we just got the product up and running. And again, speed was so key that uh, that we just didn't want to mess around with that. But as we got bigger, yeah, like that becomes more of a risk. And, you know, maybe more less than it being a risk that we just thought there's opportunity to do more for our customers and solve their problems here if we build in a way that lets us use uh, lots of models. And we thought, you know, the world is not going to be dominated by one language model in the future. We really built our product in a way that we could sit on top of any number of large language models, call them at various points in the user journey, call them for various templates or use cases inside of our product, and basically uh, not be constrained with, with using kind of anything in particular, but always use the best model for the best job at the best time to give our customers the highest quality outputs. But yeah, now, now we use, you know, oh, again, we still use OpenAI a ton. They're awesome. You know, we use models like Cohere and Anthropic. And, you know, we're always playing around with the newest, you know, uh, open source models that come out. And so what I would recommend to people building on these is early days, do whatever's fast and easy and whatever saves you some time. And, you know, long term, you can look at fine tuning building your own language models, you know, using kind of the data that you've collected to go train, you know, models for your users. But like, I don't think for most people that is something that needs to happen out of the gate. Uh, and just like speed is key as you build on these things. Actually, you just led me to my next question, which is what are some of the things that you've done at Jasper to really accelerate your trajectory and to maintain your advantage of being number one? Yeah, well, it is exhausting. I mean, this market is absolutely nuts. Um, That's you know, a fair statement. Like That's a very move, fair statement. It feels like I need to move two to 300 times faster than, uh, than we're moving you know, on, on many days. No, the market's amazing. It's so hard to keep up. And I think for us, we kind of got to this place in our company a few months ago where we were just paying so much attention to everything that was out there. And it all felt so new. And we have to know. And we're going to left behind if we don't know what's going on that it actually kind of caused us to stall out on just the stuff that we were building internally. And we're like, you know, we've got a pretty good plan. I think if we execute on it, we've got a really good shot at building something great here. And, and the biggest risk for us is, is not kind of getting beat by somebody else. It's like that we just don't have our stuff together internally. And so like, let's stop watching everyone else. Let's start building on our vision here. And like, we'll iterate, you know, as we go. And I think one thing that's helped us is just getting much tighter and, and thinking more short term I and mean, we have a very long-term perspective on jasper but um you know any given day we're saying like let's go win today let's go ship something great today let's go ship something great tomorrow let's win this week and like let's not worry about what model is going to be out there in 60 days because you know who knows everything we're doing might be obsolete in 60 days anyway let's go like win today and keep iterating and i think that has brought calmness to the company it has allowed people to feel like hey like we can see the momentum we're making talk us through how you think about defensibility in ai and for everybody out there that's right now has the same concerns that you have and you're you're you know you got there first you move faster coach everybody on how do you think about defensibility in ai and what's critical it's funny you know i talked to a lot of people about this and you know there's kind of there, there's the ai you know researchers i'll talk to and they all think the defensibility is in the application layer. And they say, oh, yeah, all the models will be commoditized. And, you know, this stuff is easy. You know, to them, it's 
I don't know if it's easy, but to them, they get it. And they're like, yeah, we're all, I, we're all working on all this stuff. It's going to be commoditized. The hard part is to do, you know, maybe what Jasper's done. And I talk to the people that know how to build apps and, you know, applications. And they say, oh, yeah, that's easy. The commodity, you know, is the application. The, the hard part is the, the AI engines and all of that. And so there's really nobody knows. And these are all, you know, smart people. And, you know, I, I think a lot of the, the things are, that in business are still, like, still remain true today. When it comes to, like, AI, I mean, the data that companies like us collect, like we get to watch the end user. How do they use the, the, the content? Where does it go? How does it perform? Like that is really, really valuable for us to take and then go and fine tune models or, you know, someday we might build some of our own models. So I think that data is probably the most traditional, uh, like moat like uh, attribute uh, of companies like ours. But I really think at the end of the day, like we talk about like just like the end user experience, like solving for the customer, building an organization that is customer obsessed and not technology obsessed is actually really hard to do. I mean, it's simple, but it's hard to do, especially in a day like this when you can just get on Twitter and there's a million tweets about technology. There's not that many about customers or what are customers going to do with this or what are the use cases here? Uh, it's just all cool technology demos. And so I think just like owning that end user relationship, building delightful uh, UIs and UXs to really solve that problem and being able to do that over and over is hard to do in a real competitive advantage long term. I want to ask about your vision for Jasper. I've heard fabulous things that you've said. You want to be a collaboration enterprise platform, kind of like a Slack. You have this really cool moment. What do you think if you fast forward five years, 10 years, what do you want Jasper to become? Yeah, I want Jasper to be the content layer in businesses. And so, you know, we're not really building for consumers. There'll be other companies that do that. But businesses, you know, generally have a style guide right now that they hand out to their marketing team. Say, hey, follow this. And nobody does it. Or even if, you know, some people do it, it's, it's really hard to, to police or enforce. And so uh, our vision is that every company would have um, a, a Jasper that is, you know, like an on-brand, speaks how they want it to speak, um, knows about their company, knows about the newest product launch that came out, instantly gets all the sales reps in the company uh, up to speed in the communication about this, um, and writes everywhere that you are. So like right now, Jasper's you know a web app that you go and you generate content in, copy and paste it back out. We've now got a web or a browser um, extension that you know works across you know most text boxes on the internet to bring Jasper into those. And, and I think like the ideal. The ideal solution is that we'd have a tool that is just already writing wherever you're already creating content and you wouldn't have to go into Jasper. And so we're going to do that through like things like API, Chrome extension, browser extensions, uh, marketplace apps, things like that. And then our, our app will be more geared towards like highly opinionated workflows that help you generate you know, a lot of great content very, very quickly. And then I think the one thing that you know, I'm open to is we are built for marketers. And I, I love marketers. And I think there is room to expand beyond that into sales teams, CS teams, you know, even across the whole organization. But I don't want to lose what we have here now. And so it's kind of a balance. If I open up the messaging and the strategy, could we like leave room for somebody else to come in and kind of be the product for marketers? It's not clear. Again, the, the market's moving so fast that I think we'll expand as we feel like we've got the strength to do that, but we'll never. We'll never leave like marketing teams out to dry. We'll always be the best there. Can you talk a little bit about what feels really obvious to you five years, 10 years out? What, what do you think the AI is going to do? Like, give me a sense of your predictions and then tell me what you think it won't do. Maybe for you, because of your perch are super clear, but maybe for everybody else who's not spending all their time thinking about it are less clear. Well, a big one I've been talking about for a while, and I've just kind of seen even over the last few days, like start to come to life more is this idea that these models will go and do things for you. And, you know, they're not just going to be writing blog posts, but they could, you know, understand the language instructions that you give them, go and follow, you know, a variety of different channels and across different products to go and, and really achieve the task and the goal that you've given them. And like, you're starting to be able to see these things to connect across different apps and talk to each other and understand more of the end goal and understand almost the infrastructure of the internet. And that's really exciting where it's, again, it's not just going to create content, but it's going to go and, um, you know, maybe Jasper will create all your content, survey your users for you to help, you know, generate seed for that content. 
and then go publish this on all your channels for you and send me a report of how everything is, you know, performing, you know, every day to my text and Slack. Like it'll do that. And it just frees people up to be creative and to think about the higher level things. I think today's jobs will be at risk. And if you insist on being a blog post writer that charges $10 a blog post, you're going to be out of the job. But that person, if they're talented and thoughtful and work hard, will be able to build really great campaigns and content, you know, using tools like Jasper there. So that's probably the number one thing that I think we're going to see soon is that it's like, it's actually doing stuff for you. The thing that I think would be really hard is doing stuff for you in the physical world. And there's always just been this gap between what we're doing, like on our computers and digital and like, where is it in my house? Like, you know, whatever we've got Roomba and you've got some like, you know, lights, you know, you got an Alexa, but like most of my house feels pretty dumb. Are there areas that you think are going to move faster than others? If you think about the, the the general category of AI, would you say there's like very simple, clear, low-hanging fruit? You know, I think places where there's a lot of good training data, you know, are, are easier to go and tackle. Um, you know, again, I think things like code has has been pretty quick to get adopted and works really well because you got very structured, you know, through you know, Stack Overflow and places like that, you know, different code bases that you can kind of train off of. And is there anywhere where there's like a lot of like, you know, content that, you know, is like relatively structured, you know, is an easy place to go and build tools there. You know, for us, we've always focused on like, what are valuable use cases? Like, what are use cases that people are like willing to pay money for? And obviously, like, those are nice because there's a market for it. And, you know, companies can solve those and spend more time solving those because people are willing to pay, you know, for those and help fund those. And, People just need to learn these tools. They need to understand it. And they need to learn and work on things like critical thinking skills and communication skills. And like all of these should help assist those. But it's going to be really cool just how much it opens up a lot of people to do really great work. And we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. I want to go a little bit, Dave, to you now. Um, I always like to ask, was there something in your childhood that you directly... Did your parents do something that, you know, you look back on and you're like, God, that was really effective in making me feel special or, or, or being successful? You know, they, they pushed me, but not in a traditional have to have straight A's and have to maybe follow all of the normal channels of success or markers of success. And so, they, you know, they cared that I like really worked hard. And, you know, I think from an early age, I definitely like liked making money. And like, I remember my mom one time said, hey, I'll pay you a penny for every dandelion in our yard that you pick. And, and what I heard was, my mom wants dandelions. Uh, she will pay me a penny for any dandelion she gets because maybe she's working on some dandelion project or something. And so I, I, I misread that she just wanted them out of the yard. So I went over to this field across the street and there was just thousands of dandelions in this like church uh, church field. And I took my little red wagon, like filled them all up and you know brought them all back to her. Um, you know, she's like thinking, you know, all the dandelions are still in the yard. Where do these come from? And she ended up actually paying me for a lot of those there. But I was always doing weird stuff like that. And they like encourage that as opposed to me being, you know, saying, hey, go in your room and just study for this like test that you have coming up in school. So I think like they were just okay with me doing, you know, interesting little things and like encourage that, which was nice. Another thing I really love about you, Dave, is you and your co-founders have started a number of companies together. What do you think makes a fabulous co-founder? Tell us, like, what are those attributes and what have you learned that you can pay for it to everybody else? Yeah, we've got a really special relationship. We've been working together for about nine years now. We started off just as, like, three guys in the same friend group that, like, we're all trying to basically not have a boss and not have to go get a job. And so we didn't have these grand plans of someday I'm going to build the content layer for enterprises and yada, yada. It was just, hey, we want to make, like, you know, six grand a month so we don't have to go have a regular nine to five. Turns out we're actually all kind of three, uh, like, like very opposite people, you know, and if you kind of, you know, put us on like, you know, we'll do these like little co-founder, like personality tests and like, we'll be like all like equidistant from each other on the circle so that, you know, everyone is like building a different angle in the company. So it actually worked out really well. But I think at the, at the end of it, it's like, we've got a lot of trust in each other that we're going to do right by each other. 
Can you give us a sense of like what you have learned about managing yourself, self-regulation, managing stress, and any tips you have or tricks that you pull on in moments of like real anxiety? For me, it's like perspective and that ultimately this is a, a small thing. And if I just kind of keep working at it long enough, like good things are going to happen here. Um, and just really try to go back to like, what are the things that I can control and then work on those and, and less on the things that I can't control? Because uh, I'm pretty confident if I work on the things that matter and I can control them, like I, I think good things are going to happen and, and I've seen that. But if I just focus on all the externals, then it's really, really tough. So I think perspective is key. What do you hold as sacred as a founder? So I think under every great founder are sort of like these principles or rules or just something that you really believe in. What do you hold as sacred? You know, I think as far as like startup principles or even thinking about how to build business, it's like, you know, I mean, do it with people that you like. I think do things that are fun. When we started Jasper, we were just like laid off to people from our past company. Like we were burned out. And honestly, for the first year of Jasper, our, our strategy, our vision was to have fun. And it sounds so lame and short-sighted. And I'm supposed to have this huge vision. And it was like, we're just going to do things that we really enjoy doing. And we're going to do them together with people that we like. And like, you know, we think that'll work out. But it was just trying to make sure that we were in it for the long haul. And like, as long as we could cultivate that, we knew that we would keep showing up every day and keep building. And so I just don't think people are having enough fun. A lot of times, this is an exciting space, exciting time to be alive. And like doing interesting work with people that you care about is, is just like the most rewarding thing ever. And then the last one, yeah, I've mentioned this several times before, but it's like, just like let the customer draw it out of you and let that be your light and get pulled into new ideas as opposed to pushing your way into all of them. And that was probably the biggest shift we made with Jasper from previous companies. We just talked to customers way more and like let them tell us what they wanted. And now you've got to like synthesize it a little bit. You can't just, you know, build all of the things that they want. But uh, that is so key. Dave, I'm going to just ask you some quick fire round questions. I'm going to ask you first thing that comes to your head is the answer. What gets you out of bed every day? I think my family and just the ability to like leave a legacy. You know, faith is really important to me. And so I think that adds the perspective too of just knowing, hey, like I'm here, you know, for a reason and put on this earth for a reason. And, you know, if I get to go be a part of that every day, like that's pretty exciting. What's your favorite interview question when you're trying to figure out whether or not you want to be with someone, work with someone? What do you ask? I've been asking, you know, what's something that you strongly believe? And then after they explain that, say, okay, now argue as vehemently against that as you can. And I want to be able to see if people can kind of hold two disparate ideas in their head at the same time and at least entertain both because so much of building a company is, hey, we don't know what's going to come up here. We don't know if the uh, answer, you know, uh, what the answer to this problem is. We've kind of got our gut instinct, but it oftentimes is the opposite. And so I want to see if people can argue for both sides of one thing. Is there a quote that you live by? A quote that just sort of is like in the back of your head of like the rails of your life. There's a verse in the Bible, just love your neighbor as yourself. That I think is one that I think about a lot, just even with our team that, uh, yeah, super important. What is your biggest pinch me moment to date? I think it was like $4 million of ARR in like four days, like three months in with this big webinar and this big launch. And I was just like, this is out of control. So that was probably the biggest pinch me moment where I was like, okay, like we're going to make it. Is there a book that you come back to time and again, or that you recommend people, any book, doesn't have to be a business book, but a book that has impacted your life tremendously? I, you know, I always point people to the four hour work week, which is again, I think one of the early kind of books that helped a lot of people, you know, think about their life a little differently and think about work a little differently. So I'd probably think it was cheesy today. But if I've got a friend that calls me, all friends call me all the time, say, I'm starting a business, what should I do? And I'm like, read that book. So I don't know if it's like my favorite book ever. But you know, for people starting out, I, I recommend that a lot. Anything that you're excited about? Uh, and it can be something at Jasper, it can be something in innovation around you, but something that you're really jazzed about. I really love the idea of building a golf course after Jasper. So that is not uh, uh, incredibly innovative, but that's kind of my dream is we want to build golf courses all around the world. And, you know, Jasper's a platform to, uh, to hopefully help do that someday. So not a big innovation, but I just love the idea of building something tangible after working on my computer for years and years and years. I love that, Dave. Also, I'm a big golf fan, so I really like that. 
First of all, David, thank you so much for joining us today. Everybody out there, if you want to learn more, you got to check out jasper.ai, become a customer. And you can join us next week for Ink the Founders Project with Alex Von Tobel. Dave, we are rooting for you. We are all watching you. Thank you for leading the charge on an incredible moment in human history. Um, we're, we're just so grateful for all the work you're doing. And again, thank you so much for building such a fabulous tool. Awesome. Thanks, Alexa. Appreciate it.